everyone, Bridget Ayer here with All About the Grace. And on this channel, we talk about faith, culture, and media awareness. And I'm really excited about today's show because we're going to be, I'm going to be interviewing one of my favorite people, Michelle Amoroso. So welcome to All About the Grace. Hi, Bridget. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, I have to do a quick little plug for my book. If you haven't gotten a copy of my book, uh, it's called Breaking New Ground, Discipleship Using New Media, and that's really what this channel is all about. It's about using new media to evangelize, and um, so you can get that on Amazon, and there'll be a link below in the description of this video to um, get a copy of that. So, all right, so on with our topic. Obviously, everyone that knows me knows I love evangelization. That's like one of my favorite topics. And we always want to be talking about conversion. But something that people don't really think about, and this is a very big thing that's happening in our church, is reversions. And people, a reversion is someone that is Catholic, maybe baptized Catholic, but for some reason uh, left the church. Well, there are so many people out there listening that have loved ones that maybe, um, and maybe you're listening and you are someone that has maybe grown up Catholic, but for some reason you're not in the church. Um, I want to hear, uh, Michelle, so you, you did grow up Catholic. Tell us a little bit about your story and, um, you know, where, where things kind of dropped off and then how we, how you regained that. Sure. Um, I think that my story is a bit unusual. Um, I hope that it encourages people who have fallen away Catholics in their lives or under catechized um, drifters, as I would call myself, mm -hmm. um, or wanderer. I hope that it, it brings some encouragement to them because, you know, God really um, gave grace building on nature, you know, through a lot of natural relationships and talents and other uh, places in my life. So, um, I grew up outside of Chicago in the Northwest suburban area. Um, it was the seventies and my father is Italian American. My mom's Scandinavian American. And I was the youngest of four daughters. Um, my dad liked to call me the caboose because I was at the end and there was a big age gap, a long uh, age gap between me and my three older sisters. Uh, so when I came on the scene, my family wasn't I don't know that they were really doing too much in, in the way of practicing, but um, I was baptized Catholic. I got to second grade, sent to CCD. I went, I hated it so much. For whatever reason, I begged and begged my family, please let me quit. I hate this. I don't want to go. And they were, they said, eh, okay. <laughs> you know, I think they were tired. I think they had already done all of their, their work with my older siblings. They all got their full sacraments. And, you know, by the time they got to me, um, you know, the culture was changing, the church was changing, and, um, and they, weren't, they weren't really practicing anything. So um, uh, I think that, that I, I slipped right out of there. Um, my family also, just a little background, um, we were like most normal families. We had a lot of dysfunction, a lot of fun in the dysfunction. Um, you know, there was some um, genetic mental health issues and alcoholism and things like that. So, um, you know, there were struggles there. But, um, you know, God, God worked through all of that. Well, Mary, uh, Michelle, you and I met in college. We both were um, at IU, and that's where you and I um, met. And you were a music major, and I, I was a political science major. But the funny thing was, you and I were both up really early. <laughs> I think you had a music theory class, and I had a Russian class. And nobody on oh. the entire floor <laughs> was awake except for us. And, and you and I were just not morning people kind of like, you know, just, I can't talk in the morning. And that's how <laughs> I think we met. But then, so talk about college and maybe, sure. you know, heading back to mass then, or is that sure. when you went back to mass? Well, let me say that um, prior to going to college, I had a, a lot of experience working in music and theater, um, uh, amateur and professional. And so I was, I went to, to school and I was a music major. I was a vocal performance major, in fact. And um, I was getting up early. It was the hardest school. I was getting up early on Sunday mornings to study music theory. And uh, after that, going to breakfast. And after that, well, I was not going to church, but 
through the music school, I heard, oh, you know, the opera conductors, church has this great, you know, set of musicians and everything. Oh, you have to go hear it. And, you know, people were talking. And I said, oh, well, I bet all the churches have great music around here. This is a big, huge music school. So I said, why would I go to the Methodist church? I'm Catholic, right? Uh So I wanted to go hear music, this great music at the Catholic church. And there happened to be one, you know, a 10 minute walk from our dorm. So after breakfast, started walking down the street, 10 minutes down the street to hear the, hear the music. And um, I was starting to do this. And at some point, uh, I think you had asked me, you know, what I was doing. And when I mentioned I was going to this church down the street to hear the music, one day I said, oh, well, maybe I'll go with you next time. And, uh, and so it happened. And we started going there together a few times. And uh, every time, every time communion came, uh, everybody would get up and go to communion. I would sit there in the pew. And eventually, after um, you know, so many times, Bridget, you asked me, how come you never go for communion? Yeah, and I, I know. Said, I, I, as you were saying you that, I'm sitting, I, I think I do okay. because I think I, I normally, I try not to say anything, but then after a while, I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> oh, hey, what's up, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's like, wow, this big sinner, she can't go to confession and whatever. Or, or well, look, this person's really holy and, <laughs> you know, they actually, you know, really respect the Eucharist. So they're not just going to waltz up there willy nilly. You yeah, know, every, so everyone has a that. reason. Everyone yeah. has their reason, right? So, so I said, "Well, um, I can't." And uh, and you asked me about that, and I told you, "Well, I was told by my family, by my dad and my grandmother, Italian side, basically by pain of death, you are never to go up and receive communion if you are in that situation." I didn't know why, but that's just what they told me. And the warning was so heavy that I, you know, I took it to heart. I remembered it my whole life. And it just, it really started when I was young and I went to Girl Scout camp and on Sundays they took people to their denominational church. So um, I remember not going for communion then. Anyway, you said, okay, well, you know what? Let's, after mass, let's go talk to the priest. And I was thinking, okay, let's go talk to the priest. Sure, you know, you, you can do that. So we together went, you took the lead. Uh, you talked to the priest right there. We're in the back of the, the vestibule, I guess. And um and the priest, he, he asked me just a, a handful of questions. And I remember they were pretty short, like yes or no answer questions. And then he goes, yeah, okay, you can go. That's fine. You can receive communion. And, and I remember we walked the whole way home for you know, t- the whole 10 minutes thinking about, oh, wow. He said, yes, that's great. Next week I can receive communion. You know, there was, there was no explanation what, what the Eucharist was. There was no formation, no catechesis no talk about sin, no talk about going to confession beforehand. It was, I was completely, you know, ignorant of of all these things, but he said, I think I, I think I I think I probably was too, to a certain extent, because I think I remember (laughs) thinking, wow, that's so cool next week. (laughs) Yeah, right. That was the quickest RCIA process ever. So, um, so anyway, so yeah, so the next week got to the communion in mass and I got up and I went and boom, I guess that was my first communion. Um, And honestly, you know, I, I look back on that and I had to question that a few times thinking, oh my gosh, was this some rogue priest? You know, what happened here? Is, is my, was it valid and all these things? But, you know, I was, I was assured, I, you know, I sought out um, spiritual counsel and stuff and I was, I was assured I was okay. Um, and I really truly believe that in those receptions of the Eucharist that God gave me graces there. He gave me graces and those helped me and helped me carry me through a lot of other challenges and form me and continue me on my journey. Um, but I, I have to say, I also found out my grandmother while I was in college, at least was praying, having masses prayed for me. Um, I was getting cards, birthdays, Christmas and things like that. So maybe that had something to do with everything. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Well, I want to ask you, um, so what kind of fast forward you ended up in RCIA at some point? Sure. Um, definitely fast forward. After I left uh, college, I went back to the Chicago area. I tried going to my local Catholic parish. Uh, it was very different from my college experience where uh, the, the scripture came alive. The priest uh, connected contemporary culture with 
the readings and with a call to personal conversion or personal action. And so I was looking for something similar when I returned and my, my, par- my local parish fell very far short of that. In fact, instead of being inspiring, it was, I would say, a little de-inspiring, if that's uh-huh. a word. And I just stopped going. I, I just stopped. Um, but then I, I, I felt like something was, you know, calling me forth. And so I started wandering. I started looking around. I spent about 10 years wandering from, you know, one denominational church to another, to a non-denominational church, you know, a lot of that. Plus, um, I also discovered a lot of, I guess, things that seemed churchy or spiritual that were actually very new agey and occult-like. Um, things I read about in a lot of these magazines you find free in the health food store or Whole Foods. So um, I had no idea, but I was looking for something and I was really seeking peace. Um, so <clears throat> um, I, I, in my wandering, I had a bad experience with an organized religious church non-denominational church. And um, after a year there, I had a bad experience and I swore off organized religion altogether, completely. I, I think there's a lot of people that do that for various reasons, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Right. But, you know, God is so much bigger than an organized religion, I think. So no doubt. he was working on me. I mean, he had a plan. He had a plan for my salvation, my personal salvation. So, um, leading up to my, my, uh, my sacrament of confirmation, um, I found myself at um, a Catholic church, which there's a good story there. I will have to touch on that when I tell you, when I finish, finish this one. Um, and it was around Y2K time. Uh-huh. And somewhere in here, I also had heard that, um, you know, the Holy Spirit brings peace and that the Holy Spirit is sealed within you in confirmation. And I had never heard that, but I thought that is what I need. I need the Holy Spirit to be sealed within me. So I need to get confirmation. And then Y2K, I was thinking, okay, if the world's going to end, I need to be right. I need to get things together. <laughs> so, so I sought that out and I ended up getting, um, getting into an RCIA class that was vicariate wide. Uh, and it was, it was a condensed couple of months and it was I think in June or May through July and I had my first or I had my sacrament of confirmation um, in July. Um, so uh, you know when I heard I could do it in a condensed way I said sign me up. <laughs> that's, yeah that's okay. way better I mean, than going through the whole year. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah that's really awesome. And and it actually had turned out when I was seeking um, to do this my church at the time they had already started. I'd missed, you know, the beginning of the RCIA in, in the church. Um, they offered to catch me up and, you know, get me on their schedule, but I just decided I wanted the, the quicker route, you know, just get this done. So, so that's really how I ended up getting my confirmation. And as you may remember, um, I actually reached out and told you and asked you to be my confirmation sponsor. I do. And, <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah, I, I so was thinking I was, about that the other day, and I was trying to remember there was some reason why I couldn't come. I don't was I was I expecting a baby, or did I? I had something I, major I going remember. on. I don't remember. I don't either. remember, but but it, it worked out fine. Um, so I was thirty. I was thirty when I got my 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 confirmation, and I also had my first confession leading up to that confirmation. So it was quite a a, a process, you know. Um, I was very happy to be in the vicariate wide class because I think I got better catechesis um, from what I heard later about my church that I happened to be at. Um, they were doing some kind of wonky things in their RCIA training. So um, I was very fortunate to have gone through this vicariate class. Um, mentioning the wandering and how I got back to that Catholic church, God, again, working through, through ordinary grace, ordinary people, natural relationships, I had people in my life who I knew from my community theater days who I read into, reconnected with, uh, or maintained some semblance of a relationship with. And um, one of them brought me to um, this non-denominational evangelical church that I mentioned before, where I did get some good spiritual food for a year before I swore off organized religion. Um, But then another friend of mine who was in theater, she was a Christian and she had been um, 
involved in this interdenominational um, Bible study. And I had told her what happened at this other church and how I swore off organized religion. And while she and I were very social, I never did anything spiritual or religious with her until she invited me to this. She thought it would be good. I could share what happened and get some support and know that not everybody is, you know, not everybody's practices things the same way. Sure. Um, so, um, and her name was Marianne and Marianne, um, like I said, was part of my social circle. We had this small circle of friends that we did stuff with every weekend. We'd go to movies, we'd go to plays, we'd go to uh, talks, exhibits, anything arts and cultural. One day she invited this girl into our group who came from Indiana, who was also Catholic. And she didn't know who I was. I didn't know who she was, no background in either one of us. And, um, she started bragging about this music her, her church was doing and the music director and this, compo this composed piece he did that they were doing. It was so great. Oh, she was gushing and gushing. And, you know, she invited us all, like, you should just come to the church just to hear this piece. And, you know, inside I was full of pride still. And I thought, mm, yeah, okay, well, sure, I'll come. But I'll also, I'll be the judge of that. You know, here I was, uh -huh. this very long time musician and trained person and all that. She had no idea who I was. And I thought, you know, <laughs> she's bragging on and on, but anyway, so God, you know, God worked through that. He, um, he took me to this place and I heard the piece and I thought, Oh, it was pretty good. Then, um, forgot about it. Two weeks later, same thing happened. And she invited us again and I went and I heard the piece. And I also, I was there for the whole mass as I was the first time. And this time I heard something from the homily that caught my attention. And I, and after that, I thought, you know, maybe I'll go back there and I'll hear this. I'll, I'll go and hear this homily, hear, the, hear this priest give a homily again. So I went back again and I was, well, that's, yeah, okay. I like that. You know, I was, I was, I was being drawn and, um, and then I went back the next time and then, you know, I was hooked. I was hooked. So that's how I ended up back at this, at this church for about a year, this Catholic church. And I got very involved in ministry and uh, especially the music ministry. And that's where I ended up seeking the vicariate class for confirmation. But if it wasn't for that, that connection, you know, with my friend from my past theater experiences, uh, you know, this wouldn't have happened. I, I love hearing stories like this and how <laughs> God just kind of like completely like, again, someone that was completely unexpected, a friend of a friend and then you know all of a sudden she happens to be catholic and then just this interesting god can just use any situation on that note we need to take a quick break when we come back we're going to talk more with michelle amoroso about her reversion and if you're out in there and you're in a uh, non-reversion land <laughs> here's your opportunity to kind of get some ideas on how to come back so stay tuned for more I'm Bridget Ear. Uh, we're talking with our guest, Michelle Amoroso, and we're talking about her reversion story. And I want to, um, we were talking just about how God really uses ordinary life, ordinary people to, as vehicles of his grace to bring us back. Talk about that a little bit more. Sure. Um, so while I was attending this church that I had um, come back to, um, I was part of the young adult community that started up there, and I met a lot of different people. Um, I want to touch on the fact that I met um, a friend who moved into the area from Ohio, who was uh, graced by Franciscan University of Steubenville. He, um, he started having parties at his house, you know, kind of parties people want to go to, and his, his parties became very epic um, in the area, and it seemed that all the young adults in the whole area were coming to his parties. So um, I was at one of them and I met my friend, uh, John there. And um, John was uh, having or hosting a small young adult prayer group at his home with his roommate. And, you know, I heard this and we were chit chatting and I was really like, I wanted to go to this. I was, I was wanting to, to go there and explore this. And, um, I was really trying to elicit an invitation <laughs> and eventually he did invite me to, to come if I wanted to. So I went to that group and um, it ended up being the best experience of my life, the most transitional 
the place I learned more about the faith and actually had Catholic formation. Um, we read uh, some of the great spiritual books. We discussed them. We prayed the rosary every week. We did this. So we read through many books over the years. And um, we also took breaks and watched videos of Fulton Sheen and Father Carapi. And, and so it was really, really awesome. Um, wow. There, yeah. And there was so much fruit born out of that group. There how many were, people, um, how many people were coming to that? I'm curious. You know, roughly. it was small and then it ebbed and flowed. I would say it, it varied at times over the years, anywhere from maybe five or six to about like 18, 20. Wow. Yeah. 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 They needed a bigger place. Um, but we also ended up doing some social things together and stuff too. So it was, it was, it was Catholic life. Um, but um, out of that group came um, three guys that went to seminary, two became priests. One of them was a Dominican priest. There were two marriages. There were some women discerning religious life. Um, and of course, you know, for me, that really was the transition and, and all that brought me closer to God and the sacraments. Um, so it was really just, you know, having gone to a party, was talking to somebody and, uh, and I ended up at this group. And I think all those rosaries, I learned to pray the rosary and I was being formed through all of the um, stuff we were reading and discussing and just the relationships that were built there made a huge difference. Um, part of part of that uh, time also led me to seek spiritual direction, um, and I was praying for a spiritual spiritual director. And I had one false start, um, and then uh, I I gave it some rest. I prayed some more, and then I started going to this, one of the churches that some of my group members were going to, and. There was a new priest there because they did their annual, you know, move, movement of priests, new mm -hmm. young Polish priest there. And I liked his homilies and I went to confession for it with him. After a few times, I went up, I went face to face. And when I went face to face after at the end of my confession, he said, there's this book you should read. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my gosh, really? What? You're giving me help, spiritual food. And uh, he told me um, it's a name God alone suffices. And he told me the name of the author, where to get it. Uh, I ran out and got it. A month later, I read the book. I was back in confession. And I said, Father, oh my gosh, this book you recommended was so great. you know. And I start talking in confession about it a little bit. And he said, you know, if you want to talk more about it, we can just make an appointment at the office and, and then we'll get together and talk more. And I thought, oh my gosh, I went back to my small group. I have a priest that actually has time to talk to me. He's going to answer my questions. It's great. I'm just so excited. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I made that appointment. I went and talked to him. And this happened a couple more times. And we, we also talked a little bit about other spiritual things and questions I had. And uh, maybe the fourth time he said, you know, if you want me to be your spiritual director, you have to ask me. Wow. <laughs> and, and I thought, Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. You know, I wasn't thinking of this as direction. I, I, you know, it hadn't made any connections, but I said, Oh, okay. You know, so I, I, I came back again, discussed with my small group, went back, asked him to be my director. And he said, yes. And um, it was through there that my faith life really started to take root. Um, I was assigned to read the diary of St. Faustina and meditate on that for as long as it took to finish it. All my penances for about a year were pretty much the same thing, which was go in front of the Eucharist and meditate on how much God loves you. And that's a great penance. It, it was, it was. Um, and so between, you know, my direction, my, my study and meditation on the diary of Faustina and that penance, I really came to understand God's love for me and his infinite mercy for me and discovered that I uh, had the real presence was in my heart and in the Eucharist and that um, I was a beloved child of God. So that was, that was life transforming, you know, um, right there, that formational experience. Um, I, I have and, to add. And those, are, and those are central teachings of the faith. God loves mm -hmm. us. You are loved by God. You know, there isn't anyone right. like you. And the source and summit of our faith is in the Eucharist. Yeah. And, and I, I got to say one more thing as you've been talking just about your grandmother praying. 
And I just, I keep thinking of that as you're, as you're telling this story and just how, when we pray for other people, our loved ones, our family members, you know, to come back to the church or to have an experience of God, those prayers are so powerful. And I mean, who knows how long your grandmother was praying for you? I mean, probably Mm -hmm. years. Probably. Yeah. I don't know. I wish, I wish I did know actually, but I, I don't, she's gone now, but but yeah, um, I think the prayers are so powerful. Plus my, my spiritual director, I didn't know this at the time. And I really fell backwards into um, something <laughs> through him. Um, I, I was leaving direction one time and somebody else was coming in for direction who was not from our parish. And he happened to be somebody I met through some other avenue. And, you know, it was a very quick exchange. And, and my friend said, Oh, do you know father through, you know, family in Nazareth or something? And I didn't know what he was talking about. It was like, well, okay, bye. <laughs> and um, so when I saw father again, I had to ask him, I said, well, what was that guy talking about? You know, and I found out that my director was the um, Midwest moderator for the families of Nazareth movement, which was an international lay movement that uh, had origins that lie, lie with um, St. Padre Pio and, um, and a Polish priest. Uh-huh. So anyway, I fell backwards into that, which was wonderful. Um, and through that lay movement, I learned so much more about a spirituality of living in communion with Christ through the entrustment to the Blessed Mother. And it also had a very Carmelite uh, flavor to it. And, um, you know, it was really there that I really started to live a spirituality, a Catholic spirituality that our church offers um, through these lay movements and really start to blossom more in my spiritual walk. And so much has happened that we have no time to talk about, but you know, that was a great grace. Um, my spiritual director had a charism for direction and he led me to that entrustment. I was on a retreat, the first retreat for, um, the Midwest region with that movement. And there I had, um, a very supernatural spiritual experience with the Eucharist. Um, He was praying the mass during the consecration. Um, I was just encompassed by God's love um, completely just uh, encompassed, absorbed during the, during the consecration and then the rest of the mass. Um, And um, afterward, uh, you know, I was just left collapsed sobbing um, after mass and God's grace just carried me in some way that was indescribable after that. And I didn't need sleep for the rest of the retreat. I could see everyone through the eyes that, that God sees us, Um, you know, through my entrustment with Mary, I was seeing everyone's goodness, only their goodness and their strengths. That's all I could see in them. And it was extraordinary. And I really have been carried by that experience, by that real presence of God's love and some other experiences outside of there with the Eucharist that made God truly present to me and really present. And so that really has been the pivot. I think it goes back to, again, receiving the Eucharist when I was in college, just some graces there that God continued with me and continued to use that to draw me because I had a big detour, as you know, in there. And, um, you know, he brought me back this way. And it was, and it's also through, you know, continuing to walk and trust it that I've experienced a lot of healing and um, growing in holiness and found, found that I, I've been praying so much for my family um, who are non-practicing, falling away everything. Um, and actually when my mom passed away, um, as she was passing away, I was, I was very concerned for her salvation, salvation, which I'm sure my grandmother was concerned for mine and others. And, um, that was my prayer for my family for years leading up to her passing. And God gave me great consolations following that through his divine mercy, um, which is another whole great story to tell um, so many signs and things of him being merciful to my mom. Um, it gave me great peace after her passing, but, you know, I continue to try to walk in this way and trust in this way, pray this rosary, pray the divine mercy chaplet, and also use all the, um, the church's tools and things for the spiritual attacks that do come your way. You know, when you're growing holiness, the bad guy gets in there. He wants to jump all over you and separate you from God. And that's what he's done in in other ways. But um, through my formation with people 
not through any particular class or any RCIA program at the church, but through ordinary people that I learned, you know, what those tools are for spiritual warfare to, to, to deal with that. Because as, as we're always going to grow closer in communion with Christ, we're going to get attacked. So, you know, I just continue doing that walk and, um, and continue to offer my prayers for others. Well, you, you've offered such a great story of um, reversion. And I hope people that have listened to this will, um, you know, be encouraged, uh, you know, to pray for other people and to know that, that what we do in this world makes a difference and how we not just intercede, but how we have community and talk to friends and, and, and in those ordinary situations, how God can really use that. Um, before we go here, cause we're just about out of time, Michelle, um, do you, ha- I know you mentioned a couple books. Is there anything um, that's top of mind that you would want to either um, encourage people to read or just encourage them in general, any wor- parting words you want to offer here? Ab- absolutely. Absolutely. So I've encountered a lot of people that have shared with me how concerned they are for their kids and family members who are falling away. And I, you know, I say, you know what, God loves them more than you do. And God has a plan for their salvation. He has a plan for every person. So you have to pray, hope, and don't worry. And I know that's so hard to do, but, you know, I had to do this, give my anxieties and my fears over to Jesus and, and, and just pray, hope, and don't worry. And for my mom, for my family members, I prayed the rosary. I prayed the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Um, and I've had masses offered. So I would say stick to those tried and true things from, from the Catholic Church um, and try to maintain that disposition of, of hoping and not worrying about it, but and trust God, you know, God is going to take care of it. You know, he has a plan for everybody and he's going to work it. Um, I think it's just great that we continue to pray, which is really the only thing we can do because, you know, a prophet's not welcome in his own hometown. <laughs> you can say that again. Well, the, yeah. you, you heard it here. Pray, hope, and don't worry. Um, our guest today has been Michelle Amoroso sharing uh, her reversion story to the faith, and hopefully that will encourage all of our listeners. So thanks so much for being with us, and um, God bless. Thanks, Bridget. God bless you.